All right. So, so, uh, so I have some good news and some bad news. Unfortunately, the bad news is that I didn't have enough time with my. So, sorry about that. Microphone keeps cutting out. So I I completed as much as I could. So there's still some good content. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can feel free. <laughs> I apologize. I got a bad wire here. So. So my intent is at least then with what I have completed because I did not complete everything. Um, so the bad news is I am partially complete, but I have enough to at least present something about the Corot rules. And the good news is I don't have 200 slides. Like it's not, I didn't get the demos done, but I do have slides. So. So if I can at least plant a seed, I think that's a good start. Nudging folks for starters and reminding them that role rules aren't just crayons unless you use the wizard. Um, I guess they are just crayons because the wizard lets you style style the control and gives you a wrong perception of the tool because role rules are more than just highlighting a field or a row or hiding it. So the reason I wanted to cover role rules is because they are often overlooked when trying to solve some simple tasks on the forum. I mean, we all we all been there. We all automatically jump to the before field change and after field change events, or add logic into the epi view notification event. Most of the time, a role rule would have done the trick. And I'm quoting here a Bart Elia who said role rules are important as it aligns with where kinetic customizations are is going. Uh, but I don't know how they fully play into Kinetic yet. Uh, but Safe Harbor has it that they are important. Uh, so, so we're going to cover some uh, couple role rule basics first. So, so role rules. Um, I'll just go down a couple bullets here. So role rules control the visual styling of controls, but that's. That comes from Epic Course help, but it's not just that. There's a lot more. So you use the row rule to disable controls at the column level instead of control level. Um, an ex example of that, a mistake that many uh, people make is they disable a text box, let's say uh, first name on the detail sheet, but forget to disable it on the list view. Um, or if that same text box with the same epi binding exists on another tab, it's not really disabled unless you disable them all, or you use a row rule to just simply disable the epi binding, and then it'll take care of all the controls that are binded. Um, so you can, besides just styling it, you can also create the rule uh, that monitors the field in uh, in one table or data view, but then updates a field in another table. So kind of basically on the same form or uh, you can create uh, complex rule rules, define custom rule uh, conditions, rule actions. Um, for example, in a, so just the high level, uh, you set up a row rule if the order quantity is less than 10, the field is highlighted yellow or red or... And if you, uh, just just uh, to notice, if you do start to analyze Epicor's code, you will find that they as well use it for more than just coloring tool. They set column values, even use it to show message boxes and invoke other methods. So they, they say, well, if this column changes, I'll check for this other column and I'll show you a message box. So the message box actually comes from a rule action, not from not from an adapter or or so on. And then a rule action, um, so there's a condition and then there's an action. Uh, and then rule actions are added to, row, uh, to a row rule, and each action uh, attached to a row rule is performed when the row rule evaluates to true. So the condition must pass, then the actions get uh, executed. Um, 
And then this example actually is also from Epigross Help, uh, where they say you can you can cause a key field to be highlighted, which we all already know, right? You go to the wizard, uh, you pick a style, red, blue, uh, error, okay. But they also say, well, you can also use a display a dialog box or launch custom code that performs a task you define. Um, I did not check the Epicor 9 versus the Epicor 10 help file if this was added recently. Um, but uh, yeah, and then I'm just quoting Richard Riley again, uh, you do not, I mean, he always, um, I like his, I like what he always says on the forums that you do not color or control, you color the data. You do not disable or control, you disable the data. And use role, actually he says, use role rules and the UI will behave as you expect. And I've been there too, like I'm using sometimes just like, you know, disable a text box and, but when you want to, it to toggle between being disabled and enabled when something else changes, maybe a role rule uh, becomes uh, the better option. So we'll quickly review the wizard. Uh, like I'm not going to go over the entire wizard, there's just a couple of slides just to uh, refresh people if you haven't seen it in a while. So this is uh, the beautiful wizard. Um, so if you would, you can find it if if there's someone in here who hasn't used it at all, it is uh, in the customization tools dialog and under wizards and rule wizard and so the rule description field is just the description field. Uh, you just can't give it any description because it will show up when you open up the form. Uh, so you can edit your rules so you can give it a meaningful name. And uh, this is an example where the description will be visible. Now the rule view, which uh, a lot of people I have seen get, I have, I even get confused. Uh, so, so the rule view is the table or data view that contains the field you want to act upon. For example, the field you want to highlight. So I know, I know it's all the way on the top, but it, it kind of belongs all the way on the bottom. So, so whatever you set up there will actually be set on the bottom, and you cannot modify the bottom one. Uh, it'll be read only. So it's a little bit confusing. So, huh, so I always had the confusing part of remembering to click the button after you set the values; otherwise, it won't update them. Oh, and that too. Yes, yeah, it's just really fragile that screen. So then, the rule condition. Um, I'm not going to go over the list. I I, I do have it. Uh, Oops. Sorry about that. So, so just in a nutshell, I'll let you look at this for a couple of seconds. So that you know, there's column value changes, which is, I mean, most of them are self-explanatory, but when you get to the like column value changes, basically, it's kind of like that BPM one where the field changed from uh, any to other. So you don't really have to check for anything. You can just say, trigger my action when this changes. Like, I don't care what it is. Did it go up, did it go down? Um, and custom conditions is where you can do your own conditions. Uh, so if there's one thing I did not list on, on the wizard is if you do select the bit flag column, like some tables have actually the bit flag column, then you get different rule conditions. Uh, they're not here on the list, but there will be two, has and has not. And then you can check whether, uh, like the row has a memo, attachment, a CRM call, a change log, or a BPM hold. So actually those columns will become available. So you can then say, well, if bit flag has attachment, so basically your row has an attachment, then you can do um, something with it. So we'll, we'll go and, yes, sir. Uh, Pierre was asking, what Epicor version did you take your slides from? 10.2.400. Uh, ten. So then this is just the, the action section. So this is kind of where the magic happens. This is just the above that we covered was just a, just a row rule condition. Also note, that, uh, if you 
see where it says rule value. Most people click here and then they say, well, I have to select the field. Uh, just a reminder, you don't have to select, I mean, you can select a field, but you can also key in a field. You can key in three, true or false. You will not find it in a dropdown. So just key in, sometimes you need uh, true or false. Just key it in and use the arrow. It's the reminder. So, so row action applies to a whole row. So it makes sense, right? Field action and then row action. But there's also row action and grid only. So if you do not check the grid only, uh, what will happen is you will kind of get this. Like, do you really want that? So most of the time I always check grid only if I want the entire row. Like, so I'm not going to call it the entire form like this. Um, the one thing to note also, row actions are applied before field actions. So row action will get applied first. So you could color the row red, and then you could have a field action that says Make, make the whole row red, but this field yellow, so you kind of get a mix of colors. Um, and then rule setting styles. Um, I just want to clarify another thing here, uh, and I've done this too. So, so the default is basically the text within the selected field. But one thing I want to clarify is that I uh, some people get confused. Do they use the epi style highlight or the epi style invisible, or do they use the invisible or the highlight? Well, I started to use epi these ones because it tells you the text within the selected field space with the current team's highlight color. But these were from the older style infragistics, kind of like the carryover, and and. You can also create your own. So if you launch the runtime styler, you can modify your uh, one. You can clone one of these. So if someone wants a pink as a color, uh, Heather, if you're listening, uh, so you can actually clone this one and change the colors and save it to your theme and, and distribute it through theme maintenance. So it'll throw up in drop downs and in dashboards. However, if you do create your own color and you export, let's say your dashboard, if someone else tries to import it they will get an error because they don't have that color in their theme. So it's, I kind of, I kind of stay away from that. I don't want to maintain colors and across versions. And, you know, if I'm sharing a dashboard with another environment. So, so this is just, so let's, if when I generate the code, this is kind of what the wizard generates, just a quick uh, screenshot. Um, so one, one thing to note here is in the wizard, you build the condition first and then the action second. Well, the code kind of creates a reverse, right? Your action is on top. And there you go, back. My phone goes off too. Sorry. And then, so here it's just reversed. The action is on top, the condition is on the bottom, so reversed. Um, so one thing also to note is, so I usually use the wizard as a, a guide, right? I, I I kind of let it generate the code, but then I, I go and tinker with it in the script editor. So these two is uh, re these two have to match the green ones. And going back to the old screenshot, those are these two. Like I said, if you set this one, you cannot change this one, but you can encode. But then you'll you'll get an exception. So, so just to note that these the, uh, whatever whatever table you have down here, order head you have to use one of the columns here. Uh, it has to belong to order head. Um, rule syntax. So I am going to show you a couple of available constructors and methods uh, that, and some of them you cannot create with the wizard. You have to go into the code and we'll get to some code examples. So in a nutshell, um, I, this is basically a syntax for rules, just to kind of show you where the columns go. Uh, the column and then you got the condition and then the value. This is just like kind of like a basic one. Um, so the role rule constructor has a lot of constructors and I'm definitely not going to read all of these. I, there's a couple pages, but it kind of gives you an idea that there's many ways to create a role rule. Um, so, uh, constructor. Like, like you can create a row, and I'll show you in the code uh, towards the end. You can create an object called rule action, and then, and then, and then on your row rule, there's a add a, add a rule or 
there's another method you can call, but or you can just pass it in the constructor, just gonna get it done with. So that's where all these constructors and come in play. There's a bunch of them, and you can also compare and pass in a reference object and So, but this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So the role actions, right? The actions, we are all used to using the visitors that kind of set the color. They use add control settings and they can set con uh, custom colors or epic or built-in col colors like read only. And these are some, but you can also say, um, when this value changes, I want you to change the sheet and take me to this tab. So it's not in the visitor you can't, but it exists and you can make use of it. Or you can say, well, when you change this value to A, I want you to go and change this, uncheck this checkbox for me. So you can also say, you know, not just color it, but you can also say change values. Uh, there's other ones that I uh, that that exist, like um, disable columns, disable the context menu, and etc. cetera. Um, it's a couple, actually, there you go. I have listed so disable columns. Use this method to create a rule action that disables multiple columns in an epi data view. I disable an entire row. So let's say if I check a checkbox, I want you to disable this row uh, on, a, on, a, on a grid. Mm. And then rule action. So me beeping. So. All right. Calvin, can you still hear me? We can hear you. I yeah, think that was a bad All right. Someone was beeping. I thought it was my connection. Okay. Matt, I think that's you that's beeping in the background. <laughs> so. So anyway, so the sable row, um, and then uh, an epic or extra claims, and uh, well, sorry, going back to this, epic or in one of the documents actually claims that rule actions are always available that improve the performance of the sable on multiple controls. So the engine kind of handles all that by simply subscribing to these. And we'll see a few examples now. So this is just the, so as I told you earlier, I do use the visitor code but I don't like how the visitor code works and looks. When I need multiple, I, I don't go and create 10 visitors, uh, you know, 10. I just basically just build, you know, kind of build my own, just put them all in here, call me, you know, name this one row rule. And so basically I was just saying, I just basically said, oh, well, I want to um, mark all of these read only when the order is uh, closed or the release is closed. So very, very basic, but again, just not using the full wizard, but still using, you know, it's a little bit cleaner for me. Uh, another one, so it says the same as the first one, uh, just in Visual Basic. So big shout out to everyone who still goes with VB, Julie Buckner. This is typically what you can uh, also do with the wizard. Uh, same thing with, um, if the part revision is, uh, Approved. I want you. I have a couple of fields on part ref. I want to. I want you to mark them all as read only. And Epic will take care of everything for you. Like even if you're, even on, even on the tree, if you're going between revisions on part entry, it will reevaluate this. If you have not used uh, row rules before, it does it all for you. You don't have to. Like you just set it up and it reevaluates. So. Uh, so this is a little bit, uh, so this is another example. This is one where I, uh, where I create, um, so the wizard will help you with this. It's called the custom code action and uh, custom, so you can do custom condition and custom uh, action. And in this case, this, I was just showing you where I was uh, just looking up something in a BAQ results uh, data view. And if I could find a value, I just returned true or false, which kind of made the uh, row for me yellow. So, and also true or false here means read only. So nothing, I just want to show you basic examples. So now here's a little bit more complex uh, one. Uh, so 
similar similar as the before, right? You we're using a a delegate, and this is just custom code, but. Uh, Back. So, starting on the top, let's just quickly go over. So, add control settings. We all know what that does, right? It sets this column to read only or something you can also do with the wizard. But then there's also, I'm also saying, well, set that to read only, but also set this column value of this field to false. Um, and then I have a delegate, which is um, basically a custom. Uh, this is a custom uh, condition, so it's not an action. This is I'm basically saying I'm going to figure out whether you you're true, you know, true or false. But I'm doing more than just uh, what you like. I'm looking up uh, data from another table uh, using a bo reader to see if the customer is configured properly. So that's some examples you can do. Um, And then, so in this one, I in the previous one, I, I had the message box in the in the condition, which is kind of like right here. This is this is a condition. I should just return this true or false. And I had a message box in here, which isn't, I guess, I wouldn't say good practice. But in this here, in the second example, I actually split up the message box uh, in an action. But same thing. What I wanted to show you is on the top, add control settings. You mark it as uh, mark the field as read only. And there's also one called save rule result. It can you can you can define a key, and it will it'll re, it will save your uh, role result whether it uh, evaluated as uh, true or false and store it in here so you can actually look it up later. And I actually kind of snuck in the code how to look it up. There's actually on your Epi Data View there's actually a rule keys uh, property uh, like and you just define a key and it'll tell you what that uh what this like you have to give it a key name and, and then you get the value but same thing you can set column value and in this one what i wanted to point out is that so i'm using not so i'm using three items uh, uh change color save results set just for demo change this uh, field to false and I'm also mixing a custom action with all of these regular ones. So I'm doing uh, four things. And uh, so this is an action. Basically, if if this condition returns true, run all these things. And, and in this case, I was just using a custom condition, but you can actually use, I mean, you, just, you could even use something basic as if this field equals true. You don't have, you don't need a custom uh, condition all the time. I needed one because I was going to the customer table, looking up, uh, you know, a value and returning true or false where a value was set. So I needed to do something a little bit custom. And then you, you fire off on a message box. Um, uh, one one important other thing to note is you can only create one custom rule action for each row rule. So this is my uh, row rule, and I have an action uh, right actually down here. I cannot create another one. Like if I if I pasted this, I cannot create uh, create another one. So what Epicor says is create a new row rule with a new name, but use the same condition parameters. So they kind of require you to, like you cannot tag, I cannot add it here. So I can paste this one and name it RR2 and then assign this to add another one to RR2. So that's one limitation that I found with Epicor. Uh, and one, another limitation is uh, also from Epicor's KBs is, and I'm not even sure if many of you use foreign keys, but if you do to the structure of the Epicorize framework, a row rule that monitors a foreign key view runs twice. So, and they're basically saying you cannot prevent this. Uh, you basically, when once it runs once, store the value somewhere, and then and then when it runs the second time, just say you know if if my value equals true, meaning I ran, don't run it again. 
or you could now use, I think that's where Epic introduced that, uh, the rule uh, this year. You could use a rule key now. I could assign it and see if it already evaluated, then probably uh, don't need to run my code again. Um, that's as far as I got, Fred. Uh, I, at least, I hopefully at least could deliver some theor theoretical ideas and have get you thinking a little bit differently. Um, instead of using text boxes, use your rules. And the intent was to give you more of a demo and, and go through some grids, and but I did not get that far, unfortunately. Oh, Hasa, this is actually great. Um, answering Michael Cromer, yeah, we will put the slides out. We'll also put the video out up on YouTube. So we'll collect everybody's presentations. We'll definitely email those out with the minutes of the meeting, but then we'll also turn around and uh, put the videos up on YouTube for everybody, just in the section, so you don't have to download the eight hour video for the whole day. Oh, awesome. And Hasa, this is great. I'm like, I can't tell you how many times people come to me and go, I really want the users to pay attention to this field. They always make a mistake. Putting a row rule on it brings their eyes and brings their focus to that on the screen so that they double check it before they just say, yep, I entered the data. Yep. What I like to do is sometimes I have a, a checkbox. When I check this checkbox, I want you to make uh, these two other fields enabled and do all this other stuff. And what I found out is, you know, that Epicor uses row rules heavily a lot. Uh, when I was trying to debug, uh, they were using even dialogues and message boxes. And previously, I would always just do it in the well after fields change event. I'm just going to look up the you know field here. Uh, and I think that's still a fine way to do it. Uh, but maybe there's cases where row rules will just make more sense for you know colors and some of the validation and and I think it's right. Any questions, people? Uh, uh so thank you so much um, oh. for presenting on this. Um, I think we have a um, we have a request in uh, DMR processing when some materials are rejected um, that if a person chooses a certain option in one drop down, um, then uh, another drop down changes value to a, another option. Um, and I think we can use row rules for this based on what I've seen today. So I really appreciate that. But um, just to add, so yeah, you, I think you could, you could do a filter, but I think also just no, keep in mind that the Epic Core dropdown, there are ways on the properties you can set the uh, parameters and you can read other values on the form and then filter based on that. So it's kind of like dynamic filtering. I can send you a screenshot, but Epic Core does support that. Uh, it's a little bit goofy. Yeah. I've seen people do that on the text on the uh, screen object itself, or they'll modify the get list that tool. method on the business object. So you yeah, could then, also do that, Monty, and uh, modify the get list and add additional where parameters based on other screen value settings. Yeah. Well, that that's a good idea. Yes, the 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 thrust there is if they choose a certain reason code then it affects the require supplier credit resolution drop down value so um uh, yeah. anyway thanks again yeah yeah and one of the other things that we have been using jose and i and a couple others is there's a i i don't always like it but sometimes we add a before drop down uh, shows uh, there's an event as soon as we click the drop down before it actually draws to the user we just say oh filtered before but you know when you click the thing I'll, I'll refilter it so that's another way um ha, so dave miller has a do you have any of these in your live or test environment where they can see how this happens on the screen or what happens on the screen with a row rule 
And I don't know if you can share your Epicor screen or if it's, nope, it's military lockdown. You can't see it. Um, but Dave had that if uh, you have any examples of seeing that in Epicor. Uh, can you repeat that question? Uh, accidentally, my mic draw, uh, my headset disconnected. Not a problem. Dave Miller was asking if he could see some of those in live in Epicor, how they work, how the real rule is firing. Uh, I can you send them training. Uh, I don't. I have to. Okay. I would have to disconnect and get to uh, the other laptop with VPN, and that's why I couldn't build a quick demo this morning. Okay, we'll go ahead and share that afterwards, Dave. Yes. Yep. I'll be happy to. And Deal had a question. Any ideas on how to extend the range of color setting options? So yes, I think going uh, beyond the warning and everything. So there is one way to um, actually in Forgistics, right? WinForm supports all these colors and you can actually create a new control settings uh, variable in code and I can share that snippet afterwards. I just have to get to, to my code base and there's it's like four or five lines of code and you can choose any color. So instead of going to the theme and adding a color there and then saying, well, I want to use uh, I know you you name your color, you know, Fred Blue. Uh, instead of doing that, you just basically in code define the color for that time being and then well, there's there's a way and I'll share that snippet. And Good German Good German asked, how do you obtain them or how did you obtain the methods available and their signatures? Is there a document with this? The ever popular question. Yay. Uh, so there's a two two ways. So if you own the ICE SDK, so our company is uh, has the ICE SDK client, so you get the SDK documentation, which kind of gives you some of it. But the other way we, which we all have been really learning at the core, most of us is just getting .NET Reflector or .Peak and just using it for as for as an educational tool to look at the uh, methods behind the scenes. So. For those that don't know what that is, it basically decompiles a DLL uh, and just kind of gives you, shows you the code, uh, a little bit obfuscated, but it, it's enough to give you an idea. Now, also Visual Studio 2019, now uh, the new beta comes actually, when you debug Epic over it, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will decompile and even debug you into Epic or DLLs now without you needing a plugin. So if Microsoft is doing it, then it must must be okay. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> and Mark Oprant said, uh, there's some seems to be overlap between role rules and BPMs. When would you use a BPM versus a role rule? So I try to use a lot of uh, kind of like, I, I use role rules more as a cosmetic or when I kind of need instant feedback, like, if if I need uh if I check if I if I set a value to a number and I want to mark a uh, update a checkbox to be disabled and unchecked, well the BPM won't necessarily disable it for me. It's uh, BPM would is good to work with data before it kind of goes in the database. But when you need like instant and and uh, as the user is working through a screen, instant feedback on the screen, and then that's where kind of role rules come in. Right, I would think the BPM is when the method actually fires, but as you're moving between screen fields before you even hit save, yeah, yes. that would be a row rule. It would happen on the screen and be interactive with the user's experience. The BPM would, when they click a button or hit save or save or post that event to the database. Yes, you're right, yep. Or as they say, when you need to reach out and work with the users and give them that electric shock therapy through the mouse. <laughs> yep. And I've seen, again, I've seen Epic Core bringing up message boxes and I've done a few, but it's not as widespread as just, you know, marking, marking stuff read only and unchecking sometimes values. Uh, 
for example, if you have a checkbox that says, uh, let's say, track lot, or let's say, uh, I don't know if this is true, but let's say you have quantity bearing and you mark uncheck track lots, then the row rule would actually uncheck quantity bearing for you and mark it as read only say, saying, well, if you're not gonna track lots, you can't use this. So the kind of, this is just a fictitious example, uh, but that's kind of where row rules come in in play. Um, And also, also keep in mind that if you set a row rule on the epi binding, if you have that text box or that field on a list view anywhere on that form, it will honor whatever your row rule is. Uh, instead of working with controls, right? Then you need every control is good, and then you need to set all those. And then if I change, uh, if I change, you know, if I have a list view and I have multiple parts selected and I change parts, then I have to run some code that reevaluates and, and decides what to do. The role rules will handle all that automatically for you. I think that's, that's really important, Hasso, because as Epicore evolves over time, some of those fields end up on other screens, whether, yep. whether they move or whether they get duplicated because they want to show the same information. And by using a role rule, your customization is going to survive that evolution. Whereas if you did a code to disable each of those text boxes, you'd have to look and go, oh, that text box got added to this other screen, create this code or take code away if that yeah. uh, text box got removed. The rule rule deals with that all for you. And also the, that is also the other thing that I've seen is if you create a text box, sometimes Epico will create a role rule and trump your your code. Now you're fighting with the rule engine, like stop enabling my field. Huh? Well, the rule engine seems to be stronger. And then other, another thing what I did not have uh, is order of execution. So if I have a, let's say if I have a, if I have a role rule that enables or disables a field based on another value, and let's say you close the order or mark the quote line as engineered, it it will not fire your row rule. Your row rule knows that there's some, there's a there's a higher priority row rule that that kind of stopped all the other lower row rules from running. So you won't find yourself with a enable checkbox if the quote is closed because your row rule said, well that that field is true or that field value matches what I'm looking for, so I should run. No, it will say it does match, but there's another rule trumping me, so it stops. So it's you, you you stop having that mess from uh, maintaining all of that manually. I don't know if that makes yeah, any I, sense. Yeah. In dashboards, generally when we're doing design, I saw Greg Baker's post here, we'll use row rules behind dashboards to highlight anomalies yeah. in the data to the user so they know, oh, yeah. job materials was supposed to be 100 pounds of steel we issued 120 let's color that yellow if it's yeah. over 150 uh, percent then color it red so you can add these also to dashboards and add coloring to your data so that you can pull the anomalies right to the person visually and that's also a color called invisible so if in a dashboard you have a tracker and you, you want to, when you switch rows, you want on the tracker the field to be invisible. You don't need to go to a customization layer and, and do that. You just say, you add a row rule and say, well, if this field is this, mark this one as invisible. So it's it's part of a color, but actually the field disappears. So a little hack. I don't think I ever played with that. That'll be fun. <laughs> and Matt Heck asked, uh, can row rules be used to restrict a field to only allow values that meet a certain criteria? For example, only allowing yes. values above 0.2 for production yes. standard field. Yes, yes, actually Epico in one of their uh, documentations, they actually uh, show, um, they actually have an example, exactly what he just asked. Uh, they're just dealing with, uh, uh, right here. So what epic, so that you can use this column value changes, and then if the value changes, then you can have a custom action. Actually, then you can have a custom action or any action that just prevents them. Uh, so, so you you can do that. So, 
so you will just so for example uh, in here in here I would just check this custom action so I would use column value changes and then the, and then uh, you in here Epico will pass in args one and args two to you and you can say well is this args one value matching whatever I want and if you return a uh, you know false then you can create a custom code action that uh, and it throws an exception basically it says you can't do that so you can do that uh, and also mark the field red right and but then the question becomes do you like previous to the bpm do i do that here or do i want that to always uh kick in like if i dmt stuff in, do i need that uh rule then like row rules wouldn't work then like this is more client side but if you need that protection overall then maybe bpms come in play So also, if you're doing like using the REST API with a third party, BPMs are going to get kicked in, but your role rules wouldn't because the rule is only on the screen, the yes. BPMs on all the data. Yes. Yep. That's correct. It's just client side. Uh, I guess here's the. I guess uh, another. I don't know if you can see these two like see they're grayed out. I'm sure if I click click the counter sale here, it will mark these as enabled as an option to pick. And if I select them and I go and uncheck counter sale, it will uncheck them and make them as read only again. So that's all the works of like a row rule. So it's not just coloring. Like we always think row rule is color, color, color. You can do other things like enable, disable, uh, uncheck, check. Uh, so you don't. Controlling what data can go into your ERP, that's crazy talk. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Oops. Okay. Dropped off. <laughs> Did you have more to show, Hasso, or? No, no. I think that's okay. that's good because if you want to break and appreciate the opportunity, and we'll make it more practical next time. Uh, Brad, you gotta give me more time, man. One month was not <laughs> enough. One month. Was not enough. <laughs> Well, I appreciate like, you I, taking I, the time. I, I asked Jose this morning, it's like, did you start yet on your presentation? He's like, I'm starting now. It's like, I started yesterday. Yeah. It's like, it's like you, we had a month. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Hey, Jabeed, I finished last night around 9.30. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> so. Um, and Hasso, if you want to include like a text file with your code samples and things like that in with the presentation, I'll go ahead and send that out as well. So I, yes. I saw people requesting, oh, is he going to include all this? I'm like, okay, yeah. we'll that's, make sure and we'll send added, it out. That's why I added all of some of these constructors. I, I, don't know, I wasn't going to read them all, but it's more like I know we'll share this as reference. And someone, if I already spent a couple hours trying to figure them all out and get them into a document, might as well share it. So, nope, will do. And uh, I'll, I'll paste here the color one. I like that. I've never heard of the invisible color, but now I'm gonna have to go play with that just for the fun of it. Yeah, we had some, we needed we needed a drop down to be only enabled if the role mod is A, because we want the user to set it once at the dashboard, a new record, but not when it's an update. So for some reason, we just said, okay, there's invisible and try that and it worked. Yes. Yeah, I may have to just mark like 10 fields invisible if the time is divisible <laughs> by two as a whole number just to keep people on their toes. <laughs> awesome. We can go ahead and open up the floor here for 10 minutes. If anybody has any questions, time to talk. We can also uh, take a bio break if anybody needs. I'll go ahead and pick up at 11 o'clock with the what's new in 10-2.
that's going to be a fun one. So got some good news and bad news for people, but we'll, we'll focus on the good news. We've had enough bad news the past few months. 